Good morning. So glad to have you here today. It's a great weather outside except for the wind. <laughs> All right, we're going to have a great time of worship uh, together as we are gathering here in our churches. And if you hadn't heard, uh, we, can, we don't have any restrictions as to how many people can come to church anymore. There's a recent court ruling that allows us to have as many people as we want. So, of course, they recommend safety and all the other stuff, which we're going to still abide to, but uh, we can have as many as we want in worship. So just to let you know. Thank you for those of you who are joining us online as well. Uh, we're so glad to have you here. Uh, let's go ahead and stand if you're able, and let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer. Lord, thank you for bringing us here together and help us to just come together as a body of believers, Lord, knowing that you've come for us and that those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, Lord, will just experience the glory of the Lord. And may as we sing, Lord, we just express ourselves openly to all that you have for us. Help us to hear you in the midst of singing. Help us to just rejoice in all that you have for us. Bless us now, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My trials, I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles, He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask Him, He will deliver Make all my troubles quickly an end. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Tempted and tried, oh, be the great Savior. He is a kind, compassionate friend. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. He all my cares and sorrows will share. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Sorry, I missed my cue. That's okay. <laughs> All right, you may be seated. Uh, just a, a few things we want to share with you. As you know, we're collecting for the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Uh, this month, our church goal is $250, and we've collected $45 so far, so we'll collect the giving from today as well as next Sunday. Uh, but as part of that, we just also want to see, you know, we give this money to North American missionaries, and so we always want to show a video of, like, how, what are they doing with that money that we're giving to them? What are the people who are establishing new churches doing with that? So we're going to see this uh, video uh, which is from New Orleans, if I remember correctly. So let's go ahead and watch.
Well, just imagine. <laughs> okay. Um, this couple was from New Orleans. They were from a hard uh, area of New Orleans. And they were, their church is in the middle of actually a community. You know, uh, you know, there's houses nearby, a very impoverished community uh, with a lot of young people, a lot of um, uh, mothers, uh, you know, who don't have, uh, who have children who don't have any of the fathers in their life. And so it was a picture of that. And what they used was an exercise program for the kids to get them involved, to give them an opportunity to tell about the gospel, but also to share like some exercises with them. So that was their way of reaching uh, people and families so they can share the gospel in a very uh, rough neighborhood. So uh, next time we'll show two videos <laughs> and we'll make sure that they're working. Um, so with that, uh, any other announcements I may have forgotten? If not, the kids will be dismissed with Miss Melanie. And the rest of us, we're going to go ahead and stand and we're going to go ahead and sing uh, one more song. Cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at your feet. And any time that I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all my burdens down at your feet. And any time that I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. Yes. <laughs> Babies. I know you told me that that was a short song, but I didn't realize it was that short. So, but amen for short, short songs. Amen. Right? And uh, thank you again for joining us here this morning as we come and we talk about our everyday life. Uh, we talked about this last week that we're going to, in this series of our everyday life, you know, after Easter, we have had this great kind of moment of people gathering together in churches and people, uh, you know, coming and coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, but it's all what happens after you do that? What happens after you come to faith in Jesus Christ? What happens? What, what occurs in your life? Because you go back to your everyday life. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the time when I would take our youth to camp up in uh, Running Springs in the Big Bear area. And I would take them up there, and they would have such a great time. Uh, lots of games playing, but also worshiping music that they enjoy, and also just being able to pray, being able to meet new people, but also learn and be taught the Word of God. And always on that last day or the, the day before we would have to return, I would remind them, hey, it's been a great experience. Did you enjoy it? And they would say, yeah, we enjoyed it. And I said, well, remember what you learned up on the mountain, because now we have to take it down into the so my goal here is just to talk about your everyday life. Last week we talked about that restore point and how sometimes we have the tendency to kind of go back to our old habits. When we feel like Jesus is no longer in our life, we, we go back to our old habits, we go back to our old lifestyle. And I said, that's not the restore point that God wants us to do. God wants us, if we want to go to restore point, it's the time when he came into our lives and he came real to us when he saved us. That that's the point we need to get to. But today we're going to talk about something that's common to all of you here today, even though you are joining us online. And that's worry. I mean, if you've ever been a parent and have children, you worry. I remember all the times when my kids, as they became teenagers or right when they graduated out of high school, uh, they want to go out with their friends, right? And, and you say, okay, you go out, you know, you know all that, that at the time. And you as a parent would go to sleep, supposedly, <laughs> right? And it was always hard for me to sleep if my kids were not home. So I'd always listen for the door to go open, and then get off the stairs and go to their bedroom, because then I knew they were safe. 
I mean, we always have those moments of worry. I mean, what else do you worry about? Finances, right? We worry about sometimes we look uh, paycheck to paycheck. If you've ever had that experience. Uh, sometimes it's your health. You know, you have health issues that come across your life. And it's some unknowns. You know, we have the coronavirus still around. Still unknowns. And the uh, biggest worry now is like, do I get the shot? Do I not get the shot? And everybody has different opinions and stuff like that. And so you have to kind of get worried about that. Uh, maybe there's a friend at work, uh, an annoying neighbor or something like that, that, that just kind of gets on your nerves and you're worried about what they're going to uh, do in your life or how they're going to treat you. Uh, we all have worries. But what if I were to tell you that no matter what worry is in your life, there is a way to overcome it? What if I were to tell you that? Would you want to hear about that? Would you want to know how to get worry out of your life? Great, then you're here at the right time. Because we're going to go over three steps to overcoming worry. And we're going to learn it from a man called David in the Old Testament. If you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to Psalm 13. Psalm 13 is where we're going to be. And if not, if you have a copy of the bulletin, you have Psalm 13 in there. It's a very short song, just like that song. You have it in your car? Here, I'm going to give you a bulletin. Psalm 13. Written by David, and there's a couple of things you know about David. David was a warrior, wasn't he? Right? He was a warrior, he was a shepherd, he was a musician. And David, ultimately, what we knew is that he was king. And if you're ever in type of uh, leadership, you're always going to have worries. My boss asked me the other day, because I'm short staffed, and now my final staff member has left me. In. A pretty new staff, like in less than two months. And she asked me, Hey, are you worried? And I said, Yes. <laughs> you know, and I'm a man of faith, but I had to be honest with her. And that's what we're going to see with David. Because I'm going to give you step number one to overcome your worry be honest about your emotions. Be honest about your emotions. We have to be honest about how we feel. Because if not, you just keep it all inside. And keeping it all inside is not helpful when you're experiencing worry. You need to express it. You need to tell other people about that. Look at what King David wrote. He said, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And what I love about this psalm and all the other psalms, is that we get a peek into other people's experiences. Don't you love the honesty of the Bible about how some of these great leaders experience struggles, anxiety, worries? There's just honest. We get a peek into other people's experience. David is feeling like God is not there, that God has forgotten him. I mean, have you ever felt that way, that God has forgotten you? You know, it's easy when things are going great in your life and you're experiencing blessings in your life and, and everybody's getting along. You know, but yes, God is with us. But when things go the other way, when other circumstances come to your life, sometimes it feels like God isn't there. And whatever David was experiencing, whether it be a sin, some people say, maybe he wrote this after a sin with Bathsheba and he felt some guilt and he was still kind of dealing with that. Maybe it was about his son that he had to deal with. Maybe it was about all the trauma in his family. But whatever it was, he felt that God was not there, that God had forgotten about him. When you feel that God is not in your life, when you feel that nothing's getting done, let me tell you something. God is doing something in your life. When it feels like God is not there, God is doing something in your life. But David's honesty before God shows how he struggled with his face, with his faith, but he's also telling us how he feels. How he feels. Think of the disciples. After Jesus died on the cross, where were they? 
hiding. They were in fear. They were worried if that happened to Jesus, that would happen to me. They were worried that their lives were going to be much different now that Jesus was not there, that they were going to have to possibly die and experience just what Jesus did. And so what we tend to do when we worry, we tend to isolate ourselves. And that's not healthy. Isolating ourselves in moments of worry is not healthy. You need to find somebody to talk to. One thing I also notice when people worry, they worry about things that may not ever happen. You ever do that? Well, I'm worried about this. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if that happens? And they're so worried about all the what ifs that I always ask them this question. How do you know? How do you know what's going to happen? And you know what they tell me? I don't know. And then you know what I tell them? Why are you worrying? Because you can't play the what if scenario in your life. Sometimes what keeps us away from God, or we feel that God has forgotten us, is when we have sin in our life. And true, when we have sin in our life, we have a broken relationship with God. We do have a broken relationship with God, but God has not forgotten you. God is waiting for you to return to Him. Don't let sin keep you away from God. In fact, let sin get you to God. Don't worry about what's going to happen because sometimes we hear, what's God going to do? Is he going to punish me? Well, you're ready to be punished because you don't have a relationship with him. God wants to restore you. God wants to bring you together. And he wants to be honest about your feelings. When you came to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were probably honest about who you were. I remember I said, God, forgive me of all my sins. And I remember I started recounting all the sins in my life. You know, I don't think I got done with them. There were a number of them. But you know, you start thinking about all the sins that God has forgiven for me, even the, the trivial sins, right? So God has forgiven me of that. And then the Bible says that He remembers them no more. Because God wants to move on. And if we want to overcome worry, we have to come back to God. We have to be honest, of course, with how we feel. Because honesty tells us a lot about ourselves. Look at what he also says in verse 2. He says, how long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? The word counsel means to arrange plans, to figure things out. When you worry, you try and figure things out. You come up with all sorts of things, all sorts of ideas, and none of them work. None of them get rid of worry. Let me ask you a question. Has there been any benefit in worrying? Did you live longer? Were you less stressed? There is no benefit to worry. If there is, let me know. There is no benefit to worry, which is why we got to overcome worry. But David was trying to figure out how to deal with it on his own terms. He was trying to figure out, is there a way out? Is there a way I can escape these difficulties? And we can find unhealthy ways to deal with our worries. We can turn to drugs. We can turn to alcohol. We can turn to being a bitter person, a mean-spirited person. We can try and cope with our worry, which is why we got to overcome it. So we don't deal with worry in unhealthy ways. And sometimes, like I said, when we worry, we become isolated. We disengage ourselves from our friends, our family, our community, uh, even our churches. When people start to worry, sometimes they tend to get away from the church, and that's when you need the church. That's when you need the community. That's when you need to belong to somebody. Whatever David is dealing with, he can't find any resolution on his own. In fact, it's caused sorrow, it says at the latter part of verse 2, and have sorrow in my heart all the day. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? 
I remember as a little kid, I was, I don't know, maybe about 11 or 12, uh, I was not feeling good. My, my stomach was hurt. That was probably the best way I could describe it. And so my parents took me to the doctor, and the doctor, of course, checked you out and uh, talked to you a little bit. And I, I think he asked my mom or my dad, whoever was on the seat, me a little bit, and he wanted to talk to me. He said, well, tell me what's going on in your life. And I said, well, my brother was in the hospital for a while, and now my grandma's having heart problems. And, you know, again, I'm a young kid, kind of about 12 years old. And what he heard was that I had an ulcer at a very young age. But he allowed me the opportunity to express the feelings I was going through. I'm sure I didn't express it to my parents, but I allowed I was allowed to express it to my doctor. And I don't have any ulcers anymore. But at that time it caused me physical pain. And we can see with David, it's causing this deep sorrow in his heart. Because worry wears you down, not just spiritually, but physically. It wears you down. It does for no good. But now David writes something very interesting that we are to overcome worry. This is point number two. He seeks God for answers. He seeks God for answers. If you're wondering why you're worried, then seek God for answers. Ask him. And not only should you ask him, but be prepared to listen to him. And I think sometimes we ask him and then we kind of forget the listening part. We need to listen to what God is telling us. And sometimes God will speak to you directly, and sometimes God will speak to you through other people. It's interesting that when I used to be sitting in the congregation and, and the pastor was speaking, it was like the pastor was speaking directly to me. And there were a lot of hundreds of other people on there, but it sounded like the pastor was speaking directly to me, like he knew everything about my life. And I know he didn't. <laughs> but I realized that God was communicating through this person. And God was causing me to hear things that I normally wouldn't hear. But we have to seek God for answers. He says, consider, verse 3, consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Consider, he's drawing attention to God. God, look at me. Look at me. Answer me. And then he says, light up my eyes. He's asking God to revive him, to restore him, to come back to a point where he doesn't forget God, but in fact, where he remembers God. You remember that song, Do You Light Up My Life? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So those of you who are about my age would remember. Those of you who are under 40, 35, you probably don't remember. But there was this big song, and it was like a number one song. Do you light up my life? You bring me hope, right? To carry on. It was a big, I don't even remember who sang it, but it was a big song, and everybody just enjoyed it. Because it restored people, it brought people hope. It reminded them that they needed to be revived. And David came to a point where he realized he could not do this on his own. He could not overcome worry on his own. He needed God to help him along the way. He needed to talk to God. He needed God to change his perspective of his worry. And David, again, is honest in verse 4 about how he feels. He says, lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. David is shaken, man. He is experiencing this overcoming of his enemies. Now, again, we don't know the context of what David's writing, but maybe he's in a war, he's in a battle. We don't know. But we too can easily give strength to our enemies. We can give strength to Satan. When we don't trust God, we're giving strength to Satan. And we can feel overcome with that. 
we can come to a point where we too feel defeated, just like David was feeling. But let me remind you of the words of Jesus from John 16, verse 33. It says this, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have what? Peace. Peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world. Jesus has brought peace. It's just that some of us don't know Jesus. Some of us can't have peace unless we know him. He is the prince of, of peace. So David has sought God for answers. David is praying to God. But now he adds one more thing to overcoming glory. Point number three is this. Praise God for what he has done. Praise God for what he has done. We spend so much time on the glory, so much time on the what ifs, that we forget our lives to praise God. We are to praise God with our life. It's been said that we should be the walking Bible in our community. When people see us as believers in Jesus Christ, we should be reflecting who we believe. In the way we talk, in the way we text, and certainly in the way we drive. I think I shared the story that I don't put any Christian bumper stickers on my car. You know why? Because I know I'm not prone to make a mistake. I'm going to forget to turn on my blinker or I'll go through a red light. Okay, I'm not the only person who's done that. And I don't want to reflect a bad image of Jesus. So I don't want to put anything on my car. That's just me. Plus, what happens if I loan my car and somebody else is driving it? What if I loan my car to one of you? What do you do? I see how you guys feel out of the parking lot here. Ready to go to lunch? Like, let's go. But we have to praise God for what he has done. What did he do for you? He died for you. He loved you. He shared stories for you to learn. He's there for you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He's not going anywhere. And in fact, Jesus is coming back. Are you ready to be with him? Are you ready to be with Jesus? I hope you are. And if you're not, I want to tell you how you can be ready to be with Jesus so you can know with absolute certainty, certainty that you will be with him. <coughs> After all, Easter should not be the only day we remember that Jesus rose and what he had done. Every day we should see what God has done for us. Look at what he says in verse 5. He says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love, your loving kindness, your unfailing love. My heart shall what? Rejoice. Rejoice in your salvation. It shall rejoice. Jesus provides us a place to stay. <coughs> He provides us a, a job to feed our families. He provides people around us who love, pray, and cherish the company they have. David remembered and trusted in God's unfailing love for him. He remembered the times where God had saved him from destruction. He remembered all that God is doing and that what God has in place for him. And then look what it says in verse 6. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. That word bountifully means he's giving you a lot. He's giving you more than what you need. There's a word for that in the Bible. It's called grace. It's giving you something you don't deserve. He's giving you more than what you need. 
God is a generous God. God will take care of you. But you need to see how your life aligns with this. Here's something else I want you to remember. We can remember the short uh, verse, verses. Turn your protest to prayer. Turn your prayer to praise. Turn your protest to prayer. Turn your prayer to praise. That's what we saw with David. How long, O Lord? How long is this? You forgot me. How long will you hide your face? How long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? He's questioning. He's, he's protesting. But then he shifts over to prayer. Remembering God. But then his prayer turns into praise. It turns into praise. What would a worry free life look like for you? What if you didn't have to worry no more? What if you decided today is a day where I will have not have any worries in my life? I bet you we'd have the most happiest people here today. We would have the most joyous people on earth. And not only would we not be worried about worry, it would allow for opportunity for God to work in our life. Because you are worthy to him. You are, the Bible says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has created you for a purpose. God has a plan for you. And don't worry what that plan is. God will show you. God will direct you. And God will prepare you. And once you begin moving from trusting yourself to trusting God, you've overcome there was a man, his name was James Cash Penny. He's the one who started J.C. Penny. And he made some unwise commitments and became very depressed. He worried so much that he developed shingles. Anybody ever have shingles? My wife had it uh, about a year or a couple years ago. It's not fun. So he went to see his doctor who had admitted him to the hospital. And his condition became much worse. So one night he prescribed him a sedative that quickly wore off, and he awoke believing that he would die that very night. He wrote letters to his family, and he fell asleep. But he woke up the next morning and was surprised that he was still alive. He heard people singing, God will take care of you, in the chapel. And so he went in. He listened to the singing. He listened to the message with a heavy heart. But then something happened to him. He later said, I realized that I alone was responsible for my trouble. I knew that God, with his love, was there to help me. And he said, from that day forward, his life was free of worry. And it was all because he realized that God would take care of him. Don't worry. Don't be anxious, but through prayer and supplication, give your thanks to God. That's what the Bible says. And I know when worry creeps up in your life, your kids, your grandkids, your family members, when worry creeps on your life, you have to find a way to trust God. You have to find a way to be honest about how you feel, to seek God for the answer, and to praise God for what he has done. Because they're in the spirit of overcoming the world. And maybe, you, maybe some of you are wondering, if you were to die today, where would you go? Where would you go? You worry about death. I don't worry about death, but I know where I'm going, so there's no reason to worry. I may die in a car accident, a plane accident. I may trip and fall. I may have a heart attack. Anything is possible. Why am I going to worry about the what is when I know where I'm going? And if you want to know where you're going, all you have to do is ask Jesus Christ in your heart. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. Mean it. Make him number one in your life. 
God is doing something great. One more short story. Easter came, and I read, and we had great attendance. And I talked about how last week, how last week, uh, you know, generally the week after Easter again, is this peak, there's always a little valley. I've seen it over and over again. And last week, we had more attendance than Easter. Amen. Is that great? And we were still missing people. We were still missing people. We had like, you know, about six more people. We would have had our highest attendance of both in person and online services. And not only that, something God did something incredible. Ten people have given their life to Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful that God has saved these ten people? But let me tell you, God is not done and God wants to save you. You have to trust me. Let's go ahead and stand and bow our heads in prayer. Our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Let's pray. Father, if there's anybody here this morning who needs you, Lord, needs to cry out to you. Maybe they trusted in their own selves and thought their life was going the right way. But clearly they struggled. Clearly they realized that they can't do it on their own. That's you today. You need to ask Christ in your life and you want to give your life to him. You just raise your hand if you're here this morning. You want to give your life to Christ. Just raise your hand. If you're online, you can go ahead and click on that button and let us know that you want to give your life to Christ. That's you this morning. Lord, thank you for anybody at the moment, right now, to invite you into their life. That's me this morning to say a prayer like this. Say, Lord, I'm not a sinner. I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. I believe he was buried and he rose again that third day. And Lord, I invite you into my life. Ask that you would forgive me of my sin. And Lord, I promise to lead the life you call me to lead. Lord, I make you number one in my life. Give me your spirit. Help me to change the person I used to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's say it.